right. Good morning. Please be seated. Hey, let's welcome our newly married worship pastor, Basilio, back. <laughs> be kind to him today. It's good to see you. What is this now, our third service back together? Fourth? Who's counting? You are. Okay, all right. John will keep track for us. We have had some visitors here over the weeks, and we want to restart recognizing visitors. So if you are visiting with us today, there is a table right here to my left where you can fill out a visitor card, and we have a gift bag for you. So check that out if you're visiting with us today. Also at the same table, they have clipboards that have our decision cards that include prayer requests. So if you would like to submit a prayer request for the church prayer team, you can go over and fill one out before you leave today. Leave it with them, and it will get added to a prayer chain that goes out to a large email team. And if you're not on that team and you'd like to be added, give them your email address, and we'll gladly add you to that. A few announcements I've been given. If you develop a temperature or get sick during the service, you need to go home. Uh, if you're too ill to drive home, you can go to room four, which is that first room in the side door, but let an usher know you're going there, and someone will call someone to pick you up if you have a friend or neighbor who will do that, and if necessary, we'll call 911, but we don't want anyone feeling ill and not knowing what to do or where to get help. So if you need help, uh, let an usher know and head to room four. Hey, we can't have an in-house vacation Bible school, but we're not going to let that stop us. We are having an at-home vacation Bible school this year. We've had 70 people register already for an at-home vacation Bible school. Thank you to Andrea for finding this. Am I correct? It's this week from Tuesday to Thursday. You can do it in your home, and if you haven't registered yet, you can still do so through our website. And you can get more information about it there as well. So even if you don't have a child that would go into vacation Bible school, but you have a family member who does or a neighbor who does who would like to uh, take advantage of this, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. But for three days, your children can have an at-home vacation Bible school experience. Go to our website, check it out, talk to Andrea or Jan. They'd be glad to help you. Along with that, the Vacation Bible School always has a mission that is also the mission of the month. And this year it's called Sweet Sleep Family Experience, which isn't what it sounds like. It sounds like a fun camping trip. What it does is provides life-saving mosquito nets and other items for children in Uganda. And so this is a worthy mission. And if you'd like to contribute, every year we're blessed by our adults many of whom have no children in the Vacation Bible School program who want to support the mission. And so if you want to support that, you can write VBS Mission on one of the offering envelopes back here at the communion table and uh, put that on your check on the memo line, also write VBS Mission. Or you can give online uh, and select VBS on the homepage. So Enough about that. If you haven't got your communion cup yet for today, you can pick that up at the corner table as well for later in the service, and we're looking forward to that. Right now, how about turn to about three people and wave and muffle, good morning, through your mask. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we dedicate this service to our Heavenly Father today on this beautiful Father's Day. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. You are the model Father. You're ever patient, ever loving, always guiding, sometimes chastening. We need you in our life. So we thank you that all of us, men and women alike, can call you our Heavenly Father because you truly are. We know you love us. We know you care for us. That's why you sent your own son to die for us. And so we commit this service to you today. We want to honor dads, but we especially want to honor you as our Heavenly Father. So may the, all the singing and prayers and communion and words from your Bible all go to honor and glorify you because you are an awesome Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. Well, a rich man threw a lavish party at his mansion, 
And his pride and joy was this brand new saltwater pool in which he had various kinds of ocean fish. He had his whole party assemble at the edge of the pool as he showed them his newest acquisition. He released several great white sharks into his pool. They began swimming furiously back and forth. And then the rich man made an offer. I'll give a million dollars to anyone who can jump in and swim from one side of this pool now to the other. Well, he had barely gotten the words out of his mouth before he heard a loud splash. Everyone turned and looked and saw a man swimming like crazy from one end to the other, faster than any Olympic swimmer. The man gets out dripping wet and panting. The rich man runs over to congratulate him on his courage. And the man says, I just want to know one thing. Who pushed me in? Well, we'd all like to think we have courage. I've done some things in life that you might call dangerous. Rafting trips, mission trips, getting married, (laughs) becoming a pastor. But something that required a lot of courage in life was being a father, raising children. It is not for the faint of heart. You can ask Andrea how many times I would go to put Holly to bed when she was, oh, two or three years old, and she would invariably stick her finger in my nose or in my eye. I would come back bleeding or wounded, and Andrea would say, well, how did it go? And I'd say, well, I still have another eye. (laughs) But being entrusted with such a new, impressionable, vulnerable life is such a huge responsibility And it's one of the greatest sources of joy, sometimes frustration, but definitely fulfillment. I wouldn't trade the time when our children were young at home for anything in the world. So happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. You're doing a great job. And especially to those who are still raising children at home. What an important role you play in life. And it never stops. I opened a card from my oldest daughter this morning, and it said, I still need my dad, even though she's living far, far away. It's all part of the journey of life. In fact, we're all on a journey, a journey of faith. And our journey in life parallels in some fascinating ways the biblical story of the Exodus, the greatest journey in all of history. We've been looking recently at some of the milestones that can help us along our way that help the Israelites on their journey. Most recently, things like worship and how much we need that along the way. Amen. How many of you need worship in your journey in life? That's why you're here this morning. That's why you've brave coming out. You didn't know if it was going to mist or rain or be sunny. You didn't know who would be here and who would not. But you came because you need worship. You crave worship, right? You hunger and thirst for God. We also looked uh, last week at the importance of God's word. How, how God delivered his word, and for the first time, it became decentralized, where they didn't have to wait for Moses or some other prophet to deliver what God's directions were for life, but he delivered them through Moses and the others to all the people so that they could know what God's will is and how important it is to know that to keep us on track. And so now we have a completed word, our Bibles, Old and New Testament, 66 books to guide us along our journey way. Today we're going to see the importance of courage. Courage is a word that appears repeatedly throughout the Exodus story of Moses and Joshua. It means to be strong. It means to be alert. It means to be brave. It means to be bold. It is a trait needed in both men and women. True story. A woman was working as a secretary at an international airport. Her office with some other secretaries was adjacent to the room where the airport security would hold suspects. One day the security officers were questioning a man when they were suddenly called away on another emergency. To the horror of the secretary and those around her, this man was left alone in the unlocked room. After a few minutes, the door opened, and he began to walk out. 
the woman's secretary summoned all of her courage and she barked, get back in there and don't you come out until you're told. The man scurried back inside and slammed the door. When the security returned, the woman told what had happened. And without a word, an officer walked into the room and released one very frightened telephone repairman. <laughs> Don't mess with secretaries. Now, if you want to see a story about courage, turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. I hope you have your Bibles. Even though we're worshiping outdoors, you can still bring your Bible. If you don't have a Bible and you have a phone, you can turn to a Bible app. But I hope you can join me in Joshua chapter 1. As you're turning to that with me, let me set the stage for something significant that's just happened in our Exodus story. Moses has just died. After leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and through the desert for the last 40 years, he was their shepherd, he was their prophet, he was their rock, and now he's gone. Succeeding him is a man named Joshua, a former slave in Egypt, a former military leader for Moses, an assistant to Moses. He, he, if you'll recall, was one of the two courageous spies that believed that Israel could conquer the promised land when they went and spied it out 39 years ago. Unfortunately, the Israelites believed the other 10 spies who said that they couldn't, and so they didn't, wandering around the desert for the next 39 years. Have you ever lived in a desert of doubt and disobedience? It is a miserable place to live. The only way to break out is with fresh courage. But where do you get that? We shall see. If you look in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, I'm going to read the first nine verses to get us started. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That last verse is Joshua 1.9. Some of you will recognize it. For many people, it is a favorite verse, even a life verse that people live by. It is a great verse to memorize, a great verse to mark in your Bible and remember. Now, now that Joshua has heard this from God, he can do one of several things. He can either doubt God and resign from such a challenging assignment like the Israelites did before, and say, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I don't believe we can do this. Or he can stand around like some would do and debate God and question him endlessly, which is really just delaying, right? It's just stalling for time. Or he can trust God and summon the courage to move forward and do what an entire generation believed that could not be done, and now they've all died and their bodies lie buried in the desert. It's part of the sad part of the story of the Exodus, all those who doubted and rebelled against God have now died 
and their bodies are buried in the desert and they do not get to enter the promised land because they did not trust God. But their children, born in the desert, born in hardship, have learned the hard way and have learned from the mistakes of their parents and they're ready to do what their parents said could not be done. So what does Joshua do? Look at verse 10. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. Now their first test of faith is to obey God's command to finally take the promised land after 40 years of fear and unwillingness. Fear of the fortified cities they heard were there. Fear of the inhabitants who were said to be giants, all of them. Fear of failure. You know, fear of failure is one of the greatest fears in life. We would rather not risk at all than to risk and fail. But it's time to move out. It's time to conquer their fears. Their next big test is to cross that Jordan River. Before they do, I'll tell you in a moment about that, in chapter 2, we're going to move quickly through Joshua today, in chapter 2 it tells the story of two new Israelite spies who go to scout out the land again. They're hidden by a harlot named Rahab who informs them that the people all around are scared to death of them, the Israelites, having heard how their God parted the Red Sea for them, destroyed the Egyptian army, and then defeated some other kings and armies along the way. Now I want you to listen for a moment. Can you imagine this? After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites find out that the people of the land that they have feared are scared to death of them. Do you get that? They did not conquer these people because they were scared of them and they find out the people are scared of them. Folks, so often what we fear most in life turns out to be little or nothing compared to the giant we have made it out to be. And so it was with Israel. Often the things we fear the most are in our imaginations and do not turn out to be anything like we thought. Joshua chapter 3. In chapter 3, the whole nation moves to the land now and camps east of the Jordan River. They are directly opposite Jericho, the first of the cities of Canaan, heavily fortified, where they camp for three days. Look at chapter 3 in Joshua, if you have your Bible still handy. And I'm going to start in verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters... Go and stand in the river. Now, we're told in the verses that follow that the Jordan River was at flood stage at this time. So telling the priest who carry Israel's most sacred items to go stand in a river at flood stage does not seem to me to be the most logical or reasonable request. How about you? I mean, you'd really have to trust God to do this, right? Think of the courage it would take to be the first priest to step into that flooded river. Suddenly they become very polite. You go first. No, you go first. Like the story of the acrobat in the wheelbarrow. Another true story. In the summer of 1859, a 35-year-old French acrobat known as Charles Blondin, who became known as the Great Blondin, became the first person to cross the Niagara Falls Gorge on a tightrope, long before the Walendas. He repeated this act many times over the years, with daredevil acts like crossing it blindfolded, 
crossing the Niagara River 160 feet above on a two-inch thick rope with a sack completely covering his body, or on stilts on a rope, or carrying his manager on his back, or cooking an omelet on a stove he carried midway along the way, or standing on a chair that he balanced on one leg on the rope in the middle of the rope over the river, all with no safety net or safety equipment of any kind. Once he pushed a wheelbarrow across while blindfolded, and the crowds oohed and awed. Then he asked the audience, do you believe that I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? And the crowd shouted, yes, yes, you can. And Blondin asked, then who will get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> there were no takers. So get this. Try to get this image. Flooded river, flood stage. The priests have been told to carry the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments and the jar of manna and the rod of Aaron, their most precious possessions, into the flooded river and stand in the middle of the river and wait while several million men, women, children, flocks, and herds follow them into that river. That's really testing their trust. That's worse than getting in the wheelbarrow. Less than two years ago, a group from our church went on a trip to Israel, life-changing experience. Some of them are here today. And we went down in the Jordan River, and it was easy. It was a gently flowing river at a gentle spot in the river. There were hundreds of people in the river in groups from different churches doing baptisms, and we waded out waist deep, and it was fine. But it was very different back then. Do you know the Jordan River today flows at 3% of its original volume? 97% is gone. Where did it go? It's being diverted through ag agriculture. Several neighboring states have diverted the water for their own use. Population growth, pollution, many things have affected it. But back then it was a great river, and especially at flood state. So you have to wonder, if you're the Israelites, does Joshua know what he's doing? Does God? Are we all about to be drowned? I mean, we haven't had many swimming lessons in the last 40 years in the desert. This seems crazy. Does God ever ask you to do something that doesn't make sense to you? This had to be one of those things. But they do. And the moment the priest's feet touch the water, the water immediately stops flowing all the way up to a town 20 miles upstream by the name of, you ready for this, Adam. And it stops the river from flowing so that everyone can cross. Now, could this really happen? Or is this kind of one of those... Bible fables that really contains a moral story, but it didn't really happen. The only problem I have with that is that makes God out to be a liar. And that makes Jesus out to be a liar because he quotes a lot of these same stories. Some of the most spectacular stories in the Bible, Jesus quotes as if they really happen, like the story of creation or the story of Jonah. Do you know that in 1927, the same thing happened? in the very same town called Adam, 20 miles upstream from where they crossed. There are large dirt cliffs there, and there was a landslide, and the dirt blocked the river so completely that cattle began crossing back and forth. 21 hours later, after the Jordan had been completely stopped from flowing, the water broke through and it began flowing again. So don't tell me it can't happen. It has happened. It's been documented. I love that things like this happen because they only undergird our faith. They don't prove anything to anyone. People that want to doubt can still doubt, right? They can doubt that you're even here today. They can doubt anything they want. But the fact is the Bible says it happened and we believe it. So here are the priests. They're standing in the middle of a riverbed now where water has just been flowing, but it's suddenly stopped by whatever means God chooses to use. 
And now all these people cross by, passing the priests as they stand in the middle of the river and wait till the entire population of Israel has passed them by. And it took some time for that to happen because it was time for a new generation to learn to trust God. And this experience gave them much courage. It was just like 40 years earlier when their parents passed through the parting of the Red Sea. Now they've experienced a spectacular miracle and it will help them in what they're about to do ahead. In chapter 4, Joshua says, the Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Folks, to fear God means to respect God, to believe God, to trust God. God wanted his people to fear him, respect him, believe him, trust him. And so he gave them this great miracle. Now a third major test of their courage is to now take the heavily fortified city of Jericho, the first of the cities of Canaan they've been called to conquer. Turn with me in your Bible to Joshua chapter 6. We read in the very first verse of Joshua chapter 6, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Just like California for the last three months. (laughs) Verse 2, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Now, can I confess to you that once again, this does not seem to be like the best battle plan. I mean, this is not a battle plan that other armies have copied and repeated over the years. Let's march around the enemy blowing horns. What good does that do? That doesn't inspire courage. If this fails, we'll all look like fools and then we'll be destroyed by the people of Jericho. But Joshua trusts God even when it doesn't make sense to him. Oh, this is such an important lesson. Verse 6, so Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. They do this every day for six days with the armed men marching silently one time around Jericho while the priests are blowing ram's horns. What a strange sight. What an eerie sound that must have seemed to the people of Jericho. They've they've locked up the city. No one's going in or out because of the Israelites. They're watching from the, the tops of the walls, and they see this silent army march once around the city while their priests blow trumpets, and then they go back and camp. They come back the next day. They do it again. They go back and camp. They do this every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they march around Jericho seven times, just as the Lord told them to do. And it says in verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Rahab and her family were rescued, but the rest of the city was burned, looted, and destroyed. Kind of like Seattle. Verse 27 says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Joshua succeeded. Why? Because he trusted the Lord. He obeyed the Lord because the Lord was with him. And as his fame spread, so did knowledge of the one true God that had given Joshua and his people success. 
31 fortified cities and their kings were conquered by Joshua and the Israelite army over the next five to seven years. And then finally, in Joshua chapter 11, verse 23, it says, So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. So what do we learn about courage from all this? Well, one thing is that we can see that courage comes from one of three places. Courage either comes from trust in yourself and your own abilities. That's what most people in the world are relying on. That will only get you so far. But what happens when a crisis hits beyond yourself and your abilities? Many people then are broken. They lose faith in themselves and they have nothing left. Or you can put your trust in others, maybe in your family, maybe in your friends, maybe in your team, maybe in your company, maybe in your army, maybe in your nation. And that can carry you for quite a ways. But what happens when that fails you? What happens when you lose trust in those authorities? Or you can trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, many of you will know, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. That verse has helped many people through many difficult times, including me for these past few months. I have recited it to myself and to God again and again. When the path has not been clear, when the way does not make sense, when you can't see how we're going to move forward, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to get around this? How are we going to survive this? Joshua's courage was based on trust in the Lord who had helped him through all the difficult times in his life in the past. Back when he was a slave in Egypt, God got him through it. When they crossed the Red Sea to escape the Egyptian army and then it destroyed them, he was there. When they survived in the desert for 40 years relying on God for manna every day for food, from water, from rocks, for quail in the desert. God provided. More recently, he had witnessed God parting the Jordan River, stopping it so they could cross, bringing the walls of Jericho down supernaturally and helping him and the people to conquer the promised land. Listen, Joshua could trust God because God had proven himself trustworthy again and again and again. And that trust was the basis for Joshua's great faith and courage. The same is true for us. Looking back over your own life, can you see any place where God has helped you, where God has provided for you, where God has rescued you, where God has healed you, where God has saved you? Has God proven himself trustworthy to you in the past? Again and again? If so, then you can trust him with your present and you can trust him with your future. For he who promised is faithful. And based on that trust, you can have faith. And through that faith, you can have courage. Everyone needs courage, especially fathers, whom we honor today. Now, fathers are famous for a lot of things. And of course, one of them are dad jokes. Do you know when a joke becomes a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. That's, that's, that's true. It's true. You want to hear a few dad jokes? That tie in with our theme of courage, of course. My wife had to tell me to stop acting like a flamingo, so I had to put my foot down. How do you deal with a fear of speed bumps? You slowly get over it. One more. How do you handle your fear of elevators? You take steps to avoid them. 
But the Bible doesn't tell us to avoid our fears, but to face them with God's help. Did you know that Joshua's name is a Hebrew name that means Yahweh is salvation? He had originally been named Hosea. Uh, we would sometimes pronounce that Hosea. One of the prophets had that name. But Moses renamed him Yehoshea, which means Yahweh is salvation. For you see, salvation wasn't in Joshua. It was in the God of Joshua. Yeah, Yahweh, Jehovah, is our salvation. Do you know what Joshua's name is in Greek? Jesus. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' name means God is salvation, because he is. And there are some interesting parallels between the two, Joshua and Jesus. As Joshua led God's people to conquer their enemies, so Jesus has conquered our enemies of sin and Satan, and death. As Joshua led God's people into the promised land to finally find rest, so Jesus leads us into heaven to find God's rest. As Joshua was a faithful example of courage in the face of great challenges, so Jesus is our faithful example of courage in the face of great challenges. I mean, his courage took him before tribunals, before governors, before kings, all the way to the cross. You want to see the most courageous man that ever lived? Look at Jesus Christ. And Jesus calls us, his followers, to courage. He told the paralyzed man, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. He told the hemorrhaging woman, daughter, take courage, your faith has made you well. Jesus told his fearful disciples in the midst of a storm, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he tells us all, in this world you will have trouble, but be courageous, I have overcome the world. This is what we call encouragement, to have courage. This encouragement continues throughout the rest of the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, we read, Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and self-control. And then I love the message version of Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, that says, But anyone who is right with me, God speaking, thrives on loyal trust. If he cuts and runs, I won't be very happy. But we're not quitters who lose out. Oh, no, we'll stay with it and survive trusting all the way. Because trust in God is a key to having courage and freedom from fear. It's been the theme of our whole story today. The God who tells us 75 times in the Bible, do not be afraid. Now, do you think if God tells you something 75 times, he's trying to get your attention? Do you think if God tells you something 75 times, he knows it's because you need it? Your heavenly father tells you 75 times to stop being afraid and start living with courage and faith. Jesus said it himself, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. A second thing we need, an awareness, an awareness and reliance on God's presence. That is another key to having courage rather than fear in life. Because God promised to go with Joshua. He didn't just tell Joshua, you head out, good luck, I'll be waiting on the other side. Joshua would have probably resigned from that duty. He says he will be with Joshua as he was with Moses. And folks, that promise is for us as well. We love the 23rd Psalm, and we especially love verse 4 that says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In Hebrews 13, 5, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's in the New Testament. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the closing words that Jesus gives to his disciples are, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus 
is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. If the Lord is with you, there's nothing to fear. Nothing. No matter what. No matter what the doctor tells you. No matter what the news says tonight. No matter what's going on in the world around us, there's nothing to fear if the Lord is with us. Amen? Can I get an amen from some courageous people? Where do you need courage? What are the giants in your life that are scaring you? Of what are you afraid? You may feel like a kitten, but God is calling you to be a lion. You can have courage in your journey just as Joshua had in his because of the same words God gave him. Let's hear him again today. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, we thank you for going with us wherever we go. As our leader, our helper, our guide. God with us. May we see you as greater than our challenges so that we do not live in fear. Help us to be strong and courageous during these difficult times and through whatever days lie ahead. May we be examples of faith and strength to our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Lord, help your church and help your people everywhere to stay strong as we trust in you rather than in our own understanding. May we acknowledge you in all our ways Please make our paths straight. Thank you for our courageous Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, our Deliverer, in whose name we pray, amen. Now again, there are many interesting comparisons between Joshua and Jesus, who share the same name in two different languages. But here's an important difference. Joshua could fight a great battle, but only Jesus Christ can save your soul. Has he saved yours? Have you surrendered your life, your heart, your soul completely to Jesus Christ? If your faith needs strengthening, if you want courage to face this broken world, then trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Let today be the day that you acknowledge him. Maybe you need to make a public profession of your faith. Maybe you need to be baptized by immersion, by your own free choice. Let today be the day that you acknowledge him in all your ways. Maybe that means you need to recommit your life to him. Let today be the day that you acknowledge your need for a church home by coming to place membership here at Lighthouse Christian Church, which you can do so in a moment. But let today be the day for all of us that our courage is rekindled as we trust in the Lord. If you'd like to respond, come meet me down front, but let's all stand and sing of our faith in our great Father. Let's stand and sing, This Is My Father's World. Mm -hmm. 